down five. We bring in Fred Goodwin, Mr. Macro, a phrase he's been known for for years at Nomura uh, International. Fred, good to see you again. Um, what's changed the most since the last time we talked? What's changed the most in 90 days? Well, I think the most interesting thing is we've had uh, almost a Nietzsche moment. Uh, in, in other words, whatever doesn't kill us makes us stronger. So we had these two um, really black swan uh, events where you had the Middle East crisis, the dominoes of uh, Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya, and then also the, the, the very sad earthquake in, in Japan. And yet, what you would have thought that these were so far out in left field that they would have disrupted the appetite to take risk, um, mm -hmm. that, that the damage has been relatively <clears throat> modest. And uh, markets have, in fact, recovered. Yields have uh, gone a lot higher. And in fact, the ECB is so confident they've, can, they've begun their hiking cycle. Well, let's bring back this great quote. We'll continue this further. Fred Goodwin, our Nietzsche moment. Nietzsche, he was, I think, a bass player in the band Spirit from a few years ago. Markets are reflecting a belief in the resiliency of the global economy, a confidence that it would not have had a year ago. Fred Goodwin, is that confidence there to keep the risk on trade going to give us higher equity prices? Well, I think the, you've touched on a really interesting dynamic is it depends on what part of the cycle the shocks appear. So if it's early on, say it was a year ago and we had had such shocks, the damage would have been a lot more extreme. But you have to balance the shocks against how resilient uh, people believe that the economy is and that financial markets are as a reflection of that economy. So right now, What's happened and what's different than a year ago or, or perhaps in early 2009 is that we have a, a, a stronger belief in the sustainability of the global economy, in particular um, the U.S. and the European economy. For example, in Europe, we don't seem as worried about the systemic risk from the sovereign debt crisis as we would have been six, seven, eight months ago. And bring up LIBOR OIS, if you would, uh, uh, William. Um, chart number four. There it is. I guess a tear in my eye. It's, like, it's when I was less gray, like 2007. And you can see normal over there on the left side of the screen, this very short three month spread. And then up we go. Ira Jersey over at Credit Suisse, two year yield to 1.25%. Fred Goodwin, do you agree that we could see the two year really begin to normalize? Well, our call on, on rates is that the Fed is on hold uh, till the first quarter of 2013. So, I mean, if you believe that forecast, there's a lot of value in holding roll down trays at the front end of the curve uh, because the curve um, is beginning to reflect uh, the notion that the Fed, uh, you know, will end QE2, will not do QE3, and will begin to start to uh, normalize rates much sooner than our forecast, but uh, you know our economists are sticking by their guns and they, they don't think yeah. the Fed goes <clears throat> this year or next year. And I set that up, folks, for respect to Fred Goodwin and Ira Jersey and that you're allowed to have a difference of opinion here and you see it over in Europe as well. Critically, Fred, the idea, the assumption that the ECB is going to have this persistency or inertial force to just raise rates, raise rates, raise rates. There's people really pushing against that. Is this going to be a new ECB that only raises rates once or twice, maybe three times? Well, I think it's really hard to know. Now, here's what I would say is that if growth and inflation forecasts uh, or, or data evolves in line with forecasts, the notion that they'll hike 25 basis points a quarter seems reasonable. Um, there are tail risks around that view. For example, uh, with German unemployment at 20-year lows, you, you worry about some upside uh, inflation risk as their second round effects for an oil price rise feeding into wage costs. Um, and then the oil price, ins uh, on the other side of the coin, you worry about um, you know, whether at some point higher oil prices feed through into confidence and that um, you see business confidence and investor confidence drop off, and that might actually short circuit the, the rate hike cycle. But these two ideas, um, you know, upside inflation surprise or a hit from the, uh, on the growth side from a higher oil price, are right now tail risks, and the market is not too far misaligned from the idea 
that the ECB will hike once a quarter. Fred, I want to bring up a chart we just had with Richard Clarity. This is OECD inflation with the IMF World Economic Outlook out today. And I'm sorry, Fred, I just, I understand there's commodity inflation, there's other disinflation out there. Within the mix and the strategies that you have, do you believe in a higher inflation or is it opportunistic to say no, the fear is wrong and we're going to have, uh, as Chairman Greenspan would say, a quiescent period? Well, I think that's, you know, this is going to be really tough to figure out. I mean, I, I think we believe that um, inflation is generally headed higher. For example, in the U.S., if you look at what kept inflation lower for so long uh, uh, at the core level was um, uh, you know, was the rent component and vacancy rates having touched as high as 10 percent are probably coming in, uh, you know, down considerably, maybe even as far as 5 percent. And that should bias core inflation higher from these levels. Uh, in Europe, um, I, I do think we worry about uh, real rates being exceedingly low and, the, and as I mentioned earlier, the pass through. Uh, from the oil price rise into wages, particularly in places like Germany, um, where the economy is, is red hot. So, you know, I think that the generalized fear of inflation is, is probably the right one. Fred Goodwin with us, folks. We're going to come back and talk about exactly what he's doing with his money. That's what he does. He dovetails here the economic babble with, okay, but what are you going to do with your money? You heard Bill Gross there talking about the idea of, um, of going almost huge cash and negative on bonds. Do you do that? I mean, are we so certain yields are going to go higher? Yeah, I don't know. I think when one of the largest bond investors in the world is is not long and going short, that may be a reason to buy. Exactly. But, uh, Expand. <laughs> Exp what so, are you doing with the bond yield? Well, you know, to, to be fair, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not terribly disagreeing with them. I mean, as long as, as the consensus outcome uh, for the resiliency of the economy proceeds forward, and it's a relatively good year for, for equities, it's probably bad for bonds and yields go up. Uh, especially here in Europe when we're already beginning the rate hike cycle. So I don't, I don't terribly disagree with that. What I would do, though, is take a look at the spread between uh, swaps and bonds uh, in Germany. So the, the swap spread, or uh, DMSS10 on your Bloomberg. Uh, now, why is this, this is interesting? It's interesting because typically swap spreads are sensitive to a few things. When the yield curve flattens, as it will do, as the ECB raises rates and, right. and something is discounted in the forwards, or as, uh, um, as deficits generally improve through better economic growth or, in some cases, uh, in a forced way throughout Europe, the you know, swap spreads will go higher. And this time, there's actually a third thing. The third thing is that the introduction of central clearing is going to make uh, holding swaps not as attractive as it was uh, by introducing uh, new em initial margins that counterparties didn't used to have to, to pay. Mm -hmm. So those three factors to me make me think that my favorite trade is is long German government bonds versus swaps. And folks, that was great. Fred Goodwin, a little window here into how the pros talk about, it's not stuff that's retail accessible. Here's a great chart, Fred. I want to know about the dollar. Asia strengthens and approaches 1996. This is Asia DXY. This is Asian currencies, a basket without Japan. And you can see the new strength as we get back to the left corner of the chart. Fred, long or short dollar, do you stay with the Asia trade in an assumption of a weak dollar? You know, that's certainly in line with the pro-risk sentiment and the fact that the markets feel more resilient and, and, and the Nietzsche quote I started off with. And, um, and I do think that recently that the, the flows into those, uh, into those currencies have accelerated. It, to me, it looks a little dangerous here, but I can't really argue with the trend right now, um, you know, barring some other new event. Uh, and I think the event people have on their minds that, that will be disruptive for risk is when the U.S. Uh, either uh, allows the quantitative easing to end, and if not that, if they were, in fact, right. against our own forecast to start hiking rates 
um, much sooner than, than we currently forecast, say the end of this year Great. or early next. Let's leave it there. Fred Goodwin, thank you so much. Nomura International, the idea. We're going to go to break. It's